Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the World Tech World FinTech Festival in Canada. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Jennifer Reynolds, and I'm the president and CEO of Toronto Finance International. Uh, our organization uh, is a public-private partnership between the financial sector and government, and we represent uh, the financial sector globally for Canada. And we also work domestically on issues which go to the growth and competitiveness of the industry. Certainly innovation and, and our fintech ecosystem are critical for the success of the industry. And talent is also a very, very important uh, topic and, and so crucial to our success. And it's something we think a lot about, our talent pool in Canada. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and it's diversity and inclusion and how Canada views the importance of diversity and inclusion, not just to uh, for social justice, but because we think that it makes a big difference to the growth and and competitiveness uh, of our country and of our economy. And so we'll talk a bit about our approach specifically uh, in Canada and specifically to FinTech. And I am delighted to be joined by a phenomenal panel here today for this discussion. Uh, we are joined by the Honorable Mary Ng, the Minister of Small Business, Export Prom Promotion and International Trade. We're also joined by Vicki Saunders, the founder of CEO, and Peggy Vanderplash, the founding partner of Roar VC. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. So I'm going to turn the, the mic, so to speak, over to each of you to introduce yourselves. So I think it's always more interesting to hear directly from, from each of you on your background and your role and, 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 and what your thoughts are, initial thoughts on, on diversity and inclusion in Canada before we jump into discussion. So Minister Ng, I will start with you. Well, Jennifer, thank you so very much, and uh, and it's terrific to be here with all of you. I have uh, some remarks that I'm going to uh, to do as part of my introduction, so I hope that's okay. But uh, but I hope that uh, in this it frames uh, it frames it nicely for us to have a conversation. So it's terrific uh, to be here with you, and and uh, and before we start, I really do want to do. An acknowledgement that I always do, and that is I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people and very pleased to connect with you and uh, with everyone who is here who may be from uh, the various territories and the communities that you're in. And there's no doubt that this year has been a challenging one uh, that has forced many of us to make choices that I think none of us thought um, were imaginable. Countries everywhere are navigating the second wave of COVID-19, and the best thing we can do here is to ensure that Canadians are safe and that they're healthy and that everyone around the world is safe and healthy so that we continue to take those strong steps in limiting the spread of COVID-19. And at the same time, we've had to work hard to make sure that people are supported economically, particularly our small and medium-sized businesses and the millions of people who they employ, because the millions of the people that they employ, including these small and medium-sized businesses, are um, owned by, led by, and certainly employ um, people of people throughout the the country that uh, that are uh, that are you know representative of uh, of our great country. But in helping businesses get through this period is absolutely critical, and making sure that they have the emergency supports that are necessary in things like um, making sure they are able to pay payroll through wage subsidy, making sure that they have liquidity support through loans, making sure that they have. Um, fixed cost support through uh, programs like the rent subsidies. So over the last number of weeks here in Canada, we've certainly seen that uh, that there now is hope. A vaccine is on the way, and we are very, very focused on making sure that the supply chains are restored, our diversified trade relationships uh, continue to be strengthened and certainly anchored around rules-based trade. We are part of a conversation today that includes many around the world, and this is really critically important and particularly important for fintech uh, that has such a incredible presence here in Canada. And uh, one of the most uh, diverse nations uh, is Canada, and this is what we're here talking about. We're talking about the unique opportunity to diversify how we trade, but also who trades and with whom we trade. And uh, pre-COVID, if I speak, if I start with women entrepreneurs as uh, you know, as the first, as the first component, um, we can add up to 150 million dollars to the economy by 2026. So Jennifer, to your very point, it isn't the right thing to do, and it isn't social policy. It's part economic policy around the world. That number, just simply by adding women to the global to the economy, is worth 12 trillion dollars. So. There's reasons to do it beyond um, beyond uh, good social policy. It's good economic policy. So it's uh, it's advancing women's economic empowerment. But our 
government has also introduced programs that include help for black entrepreneurship. And the very first time, very first program of its kind, the Black Entrepreneurship Program that uh, is in the order of $221 million to help black entrepreneurs and business owners in our country be successful. Inclusiveness also ensures more people are included in the economy. So investing millions of dollars to help Indigenous entrepreneurs succeed amid COVID-19, before COVID-19, amid COVID-19, and certainly beyond. Uh, through investments uh, and collaborating with the National Aboriginal uh, Capital uh, Corps of uh, Association. It also means young entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs uh, who are coming up through the system um, who need to be supported and to be successful. And uh, and along that uh, sort of line of thinking, making sure that, uh, you know, Jennifer, you talked about skills, can code digital skills for youth. This is about giving young people from underrepresented groups the opportunity to develop those digital skills to participate in the current and future labor markets. So this is all very, very exciting, and there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, and at a national level, uh, Canada contributes and participates and leads along with other countries like New Zealand or Chile, where we just uh, over the summer signed a uh, gender arrangement so that we are continuing to promote uh, gender in international trade at the world level. And uh, we're not letting COVID-19 stop us from doing the work that we do. So making sure that we continue to trade and we continue to uh, lead trade missions. So the very first ever virtual trade mission um, with a women focused uh, um, component was just done uh, a few weeks ago to South Korea so that businesses can get into the Asia Pacific. So there's much work to do to rebuild from COVID-19. And there are certainly opportunities for us to be more innovative, more inclusive in the future. And I really strongly believe we have to build a strong recovery and a sustainable future that's going to benefit everyone. And everyone must include women, Indigenous people, young people, small business owners. And fintech is absolutely a part of this. Um, it's part of the solution. And I know we'll get into this, but, uh, but its ability to be able to increase access and increase access for who? For the very diverse... Uh, entrepreneurs and businesses that uh, that we all uh, that we all serve. So it's terrific to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I apologize that my intro might have been a little long, but I wanted to set the context uh, for what the Canadian government is doing and I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation. Thank you, Minister Ring. It's uh, you know glad to hear, I think, uh, some of the policies that the government put forward with respect to diversity and inclusion, with respect to making sure that um, this recovery includes everyone. It's very, very important. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicky next to uh, give us a bit of an intro on your background, Vicky. Hi, thanks, uh, everyone. And nice to see all of you today. It's wonderful to be traveling this way in the new world that we're in. Uh, I've been in Singapore, Japan, South Korea, uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK, all these places in the last couple of weeks. So uh, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Vicki Saunders. I'm the founder of SheEO.World. Uh, we are a, I'll call us a fintech innovation because we're at this today. We're, we're really here to, to uh, distribute capital in a fundamentally new way so that we can have uh, much more inclusive support of innovators in the world. So roughly 2.2% uh, of venture capital globally goes to women entrepreneurs, which is statistically impossible to occur without massive biases built into our structures and systems. Uh, and so it's our belief at CEO that we need to redesign, uh, use our imagination to come up with new financial models, new ecosystem-based approaches to get money into the hands of women entrepreneurs. If you are a woman of color, these numbers are much worse, 0.006% if you're a black entrepreneur, uh, which is just staggeringly bad. Uh, so we really need to rethink things, and we believe at CEO that this has to happen at a systems level. You can't just go create a woman's version of the existing models we have. We really need to go deeper and look at those systemic um, innovations, what the biases and barriers and blocks are. We're operating in five countries at the moment uh, with a, a unique sort of crowdfunding approach to this. Hundreds of women in each country come together, contribute capital in their country. It's pooled together, loaned out at 0% interest, which is now an interest rate that lots of people are talking about. <laughs> uh, five years ago, this was not a thing. They're like, what? Uh, so 0% interest is paid back into the fund and loaned out again. So we have this replenishing, renewable resource of finance rolling forward um, in, in support of women who are uh, working on what we call the world's to-do list, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we're only putting our capital towards the major global priorities that we're facing. 
um, one of the things that we've focused on from the very beginning is um, very, you know, a, a deep definition of diversity. Uh, so there's racial diversity, which is critical to what we're doing, but there's also age diversity and geographic diversity and sector diversity and intellectual diversity. So very broadly very defined, broadly. we're looking for new mindsets and new approaches to doing business uh, and ways of organizing our capital to distribute it uh, for the benefit of the whole. So I'm happy to be here and I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Vicki. Look forward to talking more, about, talking uh, more about your experiences. Peggy, I will turn it over to you next for your introduction. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and it's a pleasure to be uh, to be with you. It's a tough act to follow, Minister Ng and, and Vicky Sanders. So, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's interesting to be to be the last. So, as I'm sure you can see, friends originally, very very terrible echo. So maybe everyone can put himself or herself on on mute. Um, so, as I'm sure you can. Friends, originally I've been uh, I've been in Canada for uh, for close to 20 years now, and uh, my background is in uh, technology, financial services. I've been uh, lucky to work for uh, large banks, large tech companies. I also started two fintechs myself, and uh, and I manage the family office. So today I uh, I mainly do two things. I invest in uh, B2B fintechs, and I also advise financial institutions. So I'm uh, very fortunate to be uh, on several boards, and uh, I have been involved in uh, diversity and inclusion for 20 years now. And uh, so it's very interesting being uh, on every seat at the table, from an investor to an entrepreneur to an executive to an advisor, to see uh, the differences actually uh, in boardrooms and in meeting rooms when uh, when it comes to uh, allocating capital and support to women. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion and uh, hopefully bringing a lot of insights to uh, to our audience and make people think twice uh, sometimes before asking some uh, some questions. So really looking forward to that uh, to that conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, Minister Ng, maybe I'll, I'll turn the mic back to you uh, just to talk, you know, in Canada, you mentioned a few programs that we have specifically that are uh, working to promote diversity and inclusion in our economy. Uh, but I thought you might want to touch further on, you know, small business and, and in particular our innovation ecosystem here in Canada and some of the programs that the government is is putting forward to try to make sure that we're getting the economic development that we want to see in this country. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Jennifer. That's a terrific question. I mean, um, when uh, when I was appointed this time uh, by the Prime Minister, I became the Minister of both Small Business and then Export Promotion and International Trade. And really what that means is that 99% uh, of all our businesses in Canada are small and medium-sized businesses. If you take small, so those that are under 50 employees are 98%. So it's really important uh, that you know that we put a focus on supporting the startup scale up and then accessing of new markets for our Canadian businesses. And uh, there isn't a community across the country that you don't see terrific small businesses. And uh, and certainly during COVID, the work that needed to be done to just support them was absolutely enormous and that work continues. And the reason I mention this is because, because whether, you know, on the one hand, we're seeing some incredible uh, successes that are happening at this particular time that is, you know, that is allowing businesses to innovate and to grow. Um, and that growth, I mean, you know, can't be exclusive, uh, you know, sort of at the exclusion of the others that are that are genuinely challenged uh, at this time. So, um, so making sure that there are broad based emergency management or emergency support programs so that we can bridge businesses to the other uh, to the other side of, uh, of COVID is really important because it actually is about communities because those communities are those same customers. They are part of an ecosystem, I mean, or just part of community systems across the country. So um, so maybe what I'll do is just, uh, you know, sort of chat one, about one, you know, sort of one, which is, which, is the women's, uh, which is the Women's Entrepreneurship Fund, which really is building on this ecosystem approach. And, um, and you know, um, Vicky talked about sort of a new model of looking at the way in which we need to support women uh, as just one of, uh, you know, as one of the, uh, you know, segments of small businesses that need the support. And, uh, and so we as a government have been, you know, have been very, very keen at 
trying to partner, very, very keen to build upon the networks that already exist across the country through our regional development uh, agencies, very, very keen to collaborate with uh, venture funds or with, um, you know, with business organizations that already support businesses in this sort of an ecosystem approach so that we really are sort of, you know, that tide will lift all boats. Um, and, uh, and so largely our programs are on the one hand, ecosystem support and they you know and, and and that will range i mean from from you know from networks to mentoring to training and uh, and and how to you know how to help uh, uh, people get through uh, that startup and that scale up but the other part is direct uh, you know direct um, trying to get at direct access to capital for so many of these businesses that have found it tremendously difficult and a real barrier to not only entry but to growth. And that's a bit of what the Black Entrepreneurship Program is about. And then the third thing I would say, which is sort of the third leg, uh, really important in all of this, is making sure, and, and I do this with my colleague, we have a minister responsible for diversity and inclusion. And she will say to me every single time, every single time, we need to know what we're talking about here. We need to have data. We need to actually know what works and we need to understand what doesn't. So, but you've got to begin with starting with data. So working with Statistics Canada, I mean, we have knowledge hubs that actually that 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 we deliberately have put in place so that we can understand this better. So it will actually help drive the future policy and uh, investment decisions. But um, but uh, I can spend a lot of time on all of this as we all can, but all this is to say is it really does start with our small businesses uh, because the greater growth we can achieve um, at their startup and scale up, uh, the better you know the, the better job creation and economic prosperity we will get uh, yielded to uh, Canada's economy. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more on the data point. Um, you know, I've had many of those discussions with companies. We've got, you have, you got to have the data if we're going to really understand if we're being impactful. Um, good intentions are wonderful, but we want to see impact. And so maybe with that, Peggy, I'll, I'll turn it, sorry, um, Vicky, I'll turn it over to you because I know you've been in this discussion for quite some time as well around diversity and inclusion. So wanted to get your thoughts on, on its evolution, where it's at today, and where do you see the biggest opportunity for, for us to really drive the opportunities for, for entrepreneurs. Uh, well, so yeah, what are we actually talking about from a diversity piece? So there's like the racial diversity piece first, the gender diversity, um, and then all the other forms of diversity, which we look at really deeply. But I, I think we've seen uh, quite a, a shift um, and an evolution over the last five years. So uh, in 2015, when we started SHEEO, uh, I remember going on CBC, which is our national radio in Canada, uh, and saying this number, you know, less than 4% of venture capital went to women and, and people going, what? How, is that true? Like, do women apply? And questioning the statistic, right? Like, how is that even possible? Um, and then thinking there was something wrong with women with the, that number, obviously, not the system. Uh, and nobody really talked nobody about really systems talked about issues at that point. Uh, and I've just seen over the last five years, you know, all the trends in the world, the sort of pulling back of the curtain on uh, the biases in our systems and structures the, the uh, awareness level of people globally, of policymakers, is just dramatically transformed, I think. And five years, it's pretty fast to see that shift. Um, and so I think now we have quite a bit of data, we have a lot of awareness around these issues, and the question is now, how are we gonna do things differently? Uh, because you know, if you look at wage parity, uh, you know, uh, equal pay for equal work, these things have not changed despite decades of having the data. So we need to actually get into new models and new approaches. Um, and so I'm very excited that people are talking about these things. We're no longer really spending a ton of time about why is it this way, which was really something we did a few years ago, and just going, how are we going to solve this? Um, and so I think that's been a really wonderful shift to see. Um, one of the things that we've really noticed around this is, particularly with women, uh, relationships are absolutely critical to shift this. And the minister talked about ecosystem approaches uh, and ecosystems. And we're, you know, money is one part of the solution. So access to capital is one element. But one of the other things that's just unbelievable when you get in relationships is as a women entrepreneur, we often don't have access to influencers, to early customers, um, to networks to support us. And so we've taken this ecosystem approach where there's capital provided as part of the engagement with CEO, but uh, the larger piece is 
uh, we have a network full of influencers who open doors earlier than maybe you were going to get before as a small business. And it's really allowed our businesses to outperform their peers who aren't in these kind of robust ecosystem-based networks. And, and so I think that's something to really look at. And the other piece that we've done very deeply, uh, and I'm seeing this happen in other countries around the world uh, based on the leadership of Canada, is uh, this focus on Indigenous wisdom and creating the conditions for Indigenous uh, women entrepreneurs to thrive. There's an amazing uh, organization called the Lift Collective in Canada, led by Tara Fraser, um, who uh, has just done a phenomenal job. We've been doing weekly calls uh, over the last nine months since COVID started. And she's grown that organization from eight Indigenous women entrepreneurs who came on that first call to 27,000. I still can't believe what they've done together over the course of nine months. They have this huge gift guide out in the world that has uh, been celebrated. And they're really showing us how when we come together to lift each other up and collaborate, you can really transform systems. So I think this community-based, relationship-based approach uh, is one of the most uh, amazing uh, emergent sort of trends that I've seen versus this, here's your money, over to you, isolated entrepreneur, you know, despite all the odds, go thrive on your own. That narrative is dying and we're moving much more to community and ecosystem, which is great. Yeah, it's interesting. I spent quite some time in the VC community. And one of the things, one of the things I always lamented is that I didn't see enough women coming in the door. Um, they weren't even getting to pitch. And I, you know, I was curious, but why weren't they there? Why weren't they pitching? So, you know, Peggy, over to you, you know, are you, is that changing? Because I'm going back a few years when I was in that, that community. Are we getting women, uh, are we getting diversity generally um, into the VC community, um, into pitch, um, into getting those opportunities? So, so there are a few challenges um, that we need, to, we need to take into consideration on why we see, you know, you mentioned that there is only 3% of uh, dollars that are going to, to female-only uh, funded uh, companies. There, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the first one is we have very um, few women partners in VC firms. And, you know, it's still not high-raised money uh, going and you're the only woman in a sea of, uh, of men is still <laughs> quite intimidating. Quite intimidating. <laughs> It's not already very nice to ask for money. It's not the thing you want to do every morning, but on top of that, it's more difficult when you're a woman. And it's even it's more even when you're a woman of color. So uh, if you look at uh, VC firms, you have around 6% of women who are general partners and only a third of that for women of colors. So, you know, there is obviously a challenge when you're pitching some products that maybe are targeted to women and the audience is just... Yes. I would say that's the I first challenge. The, the second challenge is um, very interesting studies have been made by um, Harvard Business Review showing that when a woman comes to pitch to VC, she has a very different set yes. of than men. And the questions she tends to have are really more prevention focused. So, who, who are you going to manage your risks? And this type of questions that are very difficult to show your business on the best angle. Uh, going to have two thirds of his questions promotion. How big can you be? How great your business can be? So, so just that you know, obviously makes it very difficult for a woman to show herself in a great light. And, and the third point I want to make that we don't tend to look at is women have been included in the financial system industry very late. So if you look at Canada, the first bank started 200 years ago. It was BMO. Uh, women were allowed to open a bank account without the authorization of their husband in 1964, okay? So basically you have 200 years of history for the, for the oldest Canadian bank and only 60 years of history for women being able to open a bank account without their husband authorization. You know, you, you need to understand that context. The first VC in North America was started in 1940. Two years before a woman can take account on her own. 
So, so there are two very big implications to that. The first is that women have a very short institutional knowledge of financial services and raising money, having access to lending, because the system was not built by them for them. And the second thing is that the products that have been developed were developed for men, for men. not for women. And we tend to forget that from a personal point of view, women have very different life cycle. We have longer work. Uh, we make more breaks in our careers for the children. We unfortunately tend to earn, earn less money. So there is a huge implication from a, a personal uh, financial management. But from a business perspective, women also tend to go into areas that are more asset light, services, healthcare. These are, are areas where banks or financial institutions don't like to underwrite loan. So women are cornered from every way, I would say, by the system. And uh, Vicky mentioned that earlier, these are systematic uh, approach. You see that in every country, you know, like uh, women were allowed to open bank account alone uh, in 1960, in 1975 in the UK. So, so Canada is not late to the party. It's the same everywhere in the world, you know. And keep in mind again, again, it's always, always more difficult for women of color. So what I'm telling you that seems already impossible, impossible. to imagine for women, it's even worse for women of color. And we see that today you have new financial new impact. Financial impact. Well, there are more women that are involved in that. So uh, I'm, I'm going to stop there, but these are three things that I think you really need to keep, uh, to keep in mind. Yeah, one of the topics that has come up, obviously, with, with COVID is that um, clearly certain parts of the population are being hit harder than others. Um, and certain parts of the population are, are falling behind where they were before. Uh, women, we're uh, talking women, about the women. she session here in Canada. I think that term is being used more broadly in Canada. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, those who worked in the service sector, those types of jobs are very, very hard hit. I think there's, you know, people dealing with the stress of they can't go back to work, their work isn't there, they've got family practice at home that are making it, even if you can work in the home, very, very challenging. And I think that's wearing on certain parts of the population more than others. So, uh, Ministering, I, I thought maybe I would start with you. What are, what are some of the things you think we should be doing to make sure we don't fall back uh, further and that we recover faster for those parts of the population? Yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right, Jennifer. I mean, um, they were there before. COVID-19 just highlighted the cracks that already are in our system. So this, uh, you know, so you sort of have to take a step back and say, okay, well, what do you do about it? And do you do something about it? You absolutely do something about it. I mean, um, it's terrific. I have to brag because I just feel so proud about it. I mean, uh, Canada has its first female finance minister, right? The first finance minister. And she just tabled um, the fall economic statement just, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And you'll find in there um, exactly some of those things, exactly some of the things that we need to be doing as a country. Um, we heard loud and clear and you and, you know, I mean, the examples that you just, you know, that you just uh, said around the difficulties for, you know, a woman led business, a woman uh, worker, a uh, um, yeah, uh so you know, uh, we the challenges of uh, of balancing of wearing those 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 many many hats. I mean, throughout COVID, I've talked to a lot of you know a lot of businesses and certainly a lot of women businesses, and you 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 see it and you hear it because you see the level of juggling and struggling that uh, that has taken place over COVID. So having uh, and and you know and what is one of the issues that uh, underline that childcare. And the responsibility that women have, uh, you know, to look after their families as well. So we have made a commitment to lay the groundwork for a Canada-wide uh, um, childcare system, um, because it is uh, it's necessary. This is where social policy must complement our economic policy, because they work hand in hand. It is making sure that we will have a strategy uh, that will uh, create a million new jobs. 
a million new jobs because those that have been lost through the cam- pandemic and that need to recover from the pandemic, as you said, I mean, many of these jobs are those that are that affect women, that affect racialized people, that affect our Indigenous people. They affect those that are t- typically underrepresented. So making a commitment to create a million jobs as part of this economic recovery is something that is, uh, you know, is the challenge ahead of us, but also an excellent opportunity. And, uh, and, and that commitment is absolutely made. And, um, and making sure that uh, we provide training support to those who need it the most, those who are marginalized Canadians who absolutely need it because, you know, I don't know about you, but before COVID-19, a lot of businesses around the country were talking to me about the skill shortage and that we're, our economy was booming. We had the lowest unemployment rate that we had seen in 40 years. Um, we were creating jobs and um, and the skills that were needed across the country is very real. So so as part of this recovery, I mean, the government has given this, uh, you know, the government has, has, has given this a lot of thought and has done a lot of work around this and it's culminated in the um, in our you know in our recent um, in our recent uh, uh, fall economic statement that the finance minister table with some concrete um, um, concrete uh, commitments that uh, that we plan to tackle and and those are a few of the highlights. But suffice it to say that uh, that we must do this work. Uh, our economic prosperity absolutely depends on it which is why we've been so um, focused on the health and safety of Canadians. We absolutely are, you know, spending the, you know, sort of making those investments and they're the right investments because, you know, imagine if we didn't do that, what would happen to small businesses across this country? What would happen to those very women-owned businesses? I mean, um, the ecosystem that I was talking about the around the women's ecosystem, very early on in the pandemic, the need was there. So we had to just add money to make sure that those ecosystems were supported so that they can continue doing their work. So we've got to transition, and we will transition, from emergency support to, uh, to recovery and prosperity. Uh, and we're going to start uh, very much with the commitments we made in the fall economic statement. So, Vicky, I'm curious to get your um, comments around this too. When we first started, before we got on stage, we were talking about the stat that in Canada, 80% of, of businesses that were started since COVID hit were started by women. So, how do we support all those women? And and, and you know, how, what are you seeing in your your community? And what can we what can we be doing? So, yeah, I mean, it's a staggering statistic, isn't it? And I think, you know, it's not all positive, uh, that number, right? A lot of people are starting these businesses because they just can't cope uh, with the existing uh, rules-based work uh, that we've had in the past and all the extra things that we have to deal with during COVID, which may be like, you know, three to five-year-old kids running around (laughs) while you're trying to get your work done at home, uh, you know, sort of cut off from a lot of the social supports that we've had in the past. And so I think that's really been hard. I'm so pumped, Minister Ng. Thank you so much around the child care announcement. Uh, I made a couple of, uh, I did a couple of um, presentations to the Finance Committee and to other House of Commons committees around this being the critical action government could take to make a huge difference uh, for women entrepreneurs and women in general. So I'm very excited by Canada's leadership in this. It's literally been on the table for 50 years. <laughs> we just had the 50th anniversary uh, of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women a couple of days ago and like 50 years. So it's exciting to see this happening. Um, but one of the things that we've noticed uh, is, you know, again, I mentioned this earlier, but being in community with others, being in relationship and networks uh, with other entrepreneurs to support you uh, during this time with other people to support you is going to help you thrive or, or at least survive uh, during this time. If you're isolated, it's super, super tough. So part of the good news is that, you know, we can digitally be connected now. Uh, and so I would just you know, encourage anyone who's out there sort of struggling with these things to get into local communities around you. Uh, the minister has done an excellent job of funding uh, a lot of organizations across the country who are doing this ecosystem-based work. Uh, so there are lots of organizations out there. If you're not aware of them, ping me after I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, really happy to share those things. But um, the, this getting into, uh, you know, doing things on our own is really hard. We've been definitely trained uh, that there's scarcity out there. There's not enough for everyone. Uh, and I think this is a lie that's unraveling right now that we, when we get into community, uh, there's an abundance of need or there's an abundance of support there. I think the other uh, piece I want to say is I just can't believe how capital efficient women are. <laughs> uh, and so one of the things that, you know, 
we've seen an a hundred thousand dollar investment, a small investment, which we did direct investment through the women's entrepreneurship strategy. The federal government did that. I think that was an amazing thing. It's it's a number that we're doing at CEO as well. It's roughly hundred thousand dollar investments are like can be totally game changing for these organizations when wrapped around with advisors and influencers um, and people to make introductions for you. So last year in Canada, we saw on average at 10 new environmentally and socially sustainable jobs, like good quality living wage plus jobs uh, with each of our ventures. Um, and that is unbelievable for like a small amount of an investment uh, with all of the social capital that comes with it. So I think even just small investments uh, in our uh, small businesses can make a dramatic, uh, have a dramatic impact when it's aggregated together. And I'm, I'm quite concerned uh, about what that's going to look like. We've seen a lot of funds, uh, a lot of traditional funding sources retrench during COVID to the existing portfolio they have and kind of doubling down on them. And so we had a, a real lack of capital going to small businesses before. Uh, I think that's going to be amplified in the future. Uh, and we also have lots of data showing that investing in those women entrepreneurs helps, but it's not really moving the dial on it. And so uh, that's something that I I know that we're, we want to write big checks out to organizations so that they can do big numbers. But the challenge to the minister's point and every government struggling with this is that 99% of our economies are small and medium-sized ventures. And we have to get money directly into their hands because when we do, they have a huge impact uh, on local employment. So it is, a it is a real challenge. And I think we need new pathways to do that. We can't do it through traditional channels that we've had. So it's going to take some experimentation uh, and during COVID, we've seen lots of good experimentation from governments around this. So uh, excited to see if that will continue. Peggy, I'd be curious to get uh, your comments around what you're seeing, you know, since since COVID hit, uh, you know, in terms of diversity that you're seeing in, you know, potential founders that you're meeting with or within the own, you know, the companies within your portfolio today. And I'll piggyback on, on, on Vicky's comment because it's true, you know, everyone has been retreating to the, the companies that they've already invested in. So if you were not, I would say, part of the few uh, lucky who were able to raise money pre-COVID, it's getting even more difficult. Uh, and actually, uh, many studies are now showing that women have been, and women, and when I say women, I really want to emphasize is women from all backgrounds. Uh, have been the worst hit by uh, the lack of fundraising during COVID. So basically, uh, you're going to see a disproportionate amount, unfortunately, once COVID uh, hopefully is behind us, of women who have had to really bootstrap even more or even unfortunately uh, close down their business because they couldn't raise and it was unsustainable. So. You know, it's it, it's something that COVID or not COVID, we need to make sure that monies are strings attached. Follow the money is always the best way to make sure that capital is allocated in a way that takes into account uh, diversity and inclusion. We've discussed already how much you know the the ecosystem has been built for a very specific type of people. To be successful in and we need to actually level the playing field and you need to level the playing field by making sure that when there is money allocated from large pension funds to funds of funds to funds and to entrepreneur they are criteria that make sure that we rebalance and that women people of color have almost a disproportionate share because you cannot have a successful uh, economy with only 3% of funding going to women. And Minister Ng mentioned earlier the economic advantage of bringing women to the economy is extremely significant. So we are not talking about doing the right thing out of our good art. We are talking about doing the right thing for the economy. And it's even more important in the wake of this pandemic. So, you know, unfortunately, again, what I've seen is we're, we're going back while actually we should disproportionately double down on uh, women and people of uh, people of color. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you, you think about Canadians are proud of the diversity of our country. Um, it's something we always talk about when you think about the city I'm sitting in, 51% of the people living here were born in Canada. And I think that's brought tremendous power to our economy. And, and uh, I think, you know, we should be thinking about how do we take advantage of that in, in the biggest way that we can. Yeah, I think historically Canada's thought about as the, the resource economy and people don't think about us as, as an innovation hub, but, but we are. Uh, and that is a pillar of our economy. And it's something that, um, you know, I'd like to talk about all the time when I can, when I'm outside of our borders. But I thought maybe we should think about that and how you think diversity is tied into that innovation uh, that's happening in Canada. And I'll start with you, Minister. It's absolutely tied to it. Um, I say this as the international trade minister, Canada is so well positioned to trade with the rest of the world because we come from around the world. And, uh, and I think that that advantage is, uh, is, is, uh, is such an opportunity and, uh, and we can take it from an untapped potential to an advantage that we will have as a country. Um, in um, we just celebrated three years of uh, of an agreement, a trade agreement with the European Union, just uh, just a few days ago or last week, and uh, and there were 1,100 participants, 1,100 businesses. I mean, there was a women uh, sort of a women led, you know, uh, panel of businesses that are just looking to grow into, you know, into those markets. I mean, into South Korea it was over 200 businesses. I mean, these are these are tremendous numbers. I mean, and I think that this is just sort of, you know, the tip. But um, but uh, innovation is absolutely what we are terrific at um you know when i think about the research institutions the uh the universities that we have around the country we have this entrepreneurial sort of you know both not only in spirit but in that capability of you know of startups we are uh beginning to i hope build a better um venture capital system and uh and and uh and just a, an investment uh environment um to what peggy said earlier i mean we had to also look very closely at the uh at the venture capital funds that the government of canada was putting out there in the market and and in design make sure that 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 in those designs that we were looking at innovative models i mean and and i have to say i mean i remember you know um, colleagues saying to me, boy, you know, we're not getting a lot of submissions, but you know, um, it isn't about the submissions coming in. It's about taking the leadership and, and insisting on the design. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that the work that we're doing on the trade side, uh, around, you know, around IP, around digital trade, e-commerce negotiations. I mean, what I, you know, what, 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 what do we do as a federal government? It's to make sure that the global multi you know the global trading rules the multilateral rules based trading systems are working and that uh, and and that are that are that create that predictable investment and 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 uh, and trading environment for Canadian businesses as they grow here domestically that head into the in the head into the international market and i can't think of businesses uh, more relevant than our uh, than our innovative businesses during covid-19 minister baines stood up a made in Canada solution to deal with COVID-19, to make sure we could create PPEs in the country, to create ventilators in the country, to do more of that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that health and bio work that really is here in the country. And, uh, and so, so I guess my, my, you know, you, my, our overarching work um, that needs to continue is this collaboration between government and uh, and the private sector, but also people, because in doing all of this, uh, we mustn't forget. That's what today's panel is about. It's about inclusive. It's inclusivity and it's about diversity. And uh, and it is the right thing to do for our country. Absolutely. And I'm thrilled that Canada is absolutely leading the way. I have a feminist prime minister who is very proud to call himself a feminist prime minister. Um, but it takes that kind of leadership. So it isn't just. Uh, the right social thing to do while it is because it'll make for a better country. It's absolutely our economic prosperity and uh, and getting to that diversity and taking advantage of it, creating it as an opportunity to head into those international markets, but also supporting that domestically is the job ahead. Continues to be the job ahead. Couldn't agree more. Maybe Peggy, you'd have some perspective, obviously coming from 
uh, France to here? And what do you think that, how do you think the diversity plays into our innovation ecosystem and, and some of the successes that we're having there? Uh, you know, I think that's one of the ingredient, the main ingredient of Canada's secret sauce. You know, this opportunity to have people coming from all around the world. And, you know, we also have a very highly educated, uh, you know, Im immigration policy. So, so people who are coming are also bringing a lot of insights from what they learn in their country, from what they're seeing, maybe their former entrepreneur themselves. So, you know, you really have, again, all these ingredients and um, I look at innovation. I was leading innovation for a large Canadian bank. I've been in that ecosystem for, for 15 years now. And I'm always amazed to see how great we are in Canada. And I want, I see more on phases from our entrepreneurs to export which being a foreigner is very important for me. We are discussing that a bit offline. I think, you know, developing solutions in Canada, having in mind from the get-go that it's going to be internationally, uh, it's going to be an international market is very, very important. And I see that shift. And I think the fact that we have more and more immigrants, it's also what brings that shift in mindset from I'm only going to sell in Ontario or in Canada to well, the world is my oyster. And I think it supports, obviously, the innovation ecosystem very well. So it's extremely linked, uh, which obviously Minister Ng knows very well because it's it's in our, in our own purview. But, you know, small business, international, we need to stop about thinking about small business as local. It doesn't exist anymore. And, and that's where innovation plays. So I think we have everything. Maybe sometimes we lack confidence. I was just having that discussion with a friend of mine on a run, how we don't always talk about the times when we're, we're number one as Canadians. We should do that a little bit more. Um, Vicki, I'll turn it over to you because I know you have a global perspective too. And you know, how do you think we're doing in Canada with respect to you know diversity and as we think we look around the world and see how others are doing? Are we do we have some success stories there that you're you can think of? Uh, yeah, we definitely have success stories. And I want to I want to just, you know, tune into this like Canada as a low innovation nation. I think this is an old narrative uh, that has it's about the past. Uh, and I think many, many things have changed in the conditions in our country. And I, I don't see that as a thing anymore. And I'd also like to just, uh, you know, shine a light on the fact that we've really only seen the innovation of 50 percent of the population everywhere around the world. You know, the fact that we haven't been able to get, women haven't been able to access capital, uh, we've, we've stayed smaller. We haven't scaled up our innovations. Uh, and I think this is a crazy thing. And so if you start to redesign uh, your systems so that you can actually support women on their own terms, what we've uncovered is a staggering pipeline of revenue generating export potential ventures that are working on the world's to-do list. Like here come the women, they're coming. Uh, and so that unlocking 12 trillion globally that, that the minister talked about, it's out there. And that, that needs to come from, you know, deeply leveraged private citizens with government, with private companies, uh, creating the conditions to, to really see these companies grow. And so, you know, one of, one of uh, the companies that we've seen do very well is a company called The Alinker. And they have designed a mobility device for people who have lost uh, a lot of their mobility. So they, you know, had this insight, 50% of people who are in wheelchairs can still actually move but there's nothing designed to keep them active. So they actually deteriorate more and more. They start to be just, you know, excluded. We look down at someone who's in a wheelchair, they start to lose their confidence uh, and there's a spiral effect. And uh, the, a linker uh, allows you to stay at eye height, be in conversation with people, uh, move with people as you're walking and you move this with your feet instead of with pedals. And so it keeps you active. And this is such a unique, interesting innovation designed by a woman and in the early days uh you know she could not get any support people were like have you designed a bike before have you taken a bike to market and she's like no that's why i came up with this unbelievable innovation you know and so our network saw it and went oh my god this is amazing she came in roughly around the 50k in revenue mark has grown to uh over three million dollars is exporting uh to a dozen countries around the world uh, facilitated a lot by the network connections that have been within our community. 
you know, as we're, we take our model to different countries, someone in New Zealand goes, oh my God, that's amazing. How do we get it here? And becomes a distributor and she's pulled into that market. We've also had lots of support from the trade commissioner service from the federal government. So, you know, this, this idea of like those people who have been put to the margins, like we're not marginalized, we are put to the margins by the existing systems that we have. Uh, I think there's just, you know, we've, there's a lot of data out there that shows that those that are on the edges have different perspectives, have unique approaches, uh, and that's where innovation lives. It doesn't live at the center, connected into the middle of things. It really does live on the edges. Uh, and so I think that's a huge gift. Uh, if you're out there, women have a competitive advantage at this moment, uh, particularly racialized women who are like really excluded. They see things from a different perspective. And we're quite excited by the innovations that we see coming through uh, our pipeline. And I don't know why this is. I was talking to the minister about this a little while ago, but we have not ever seen the quality of applications that we saw this year. We could literally fund the top 40 companies at CEO. That's never happened before. And 61% of our semifinalists uh, come from black indigenous or um, uh, are women of color. So deep diversity from sector, uh, racially, age wise, um, and incredible quality. So there's there's something coming. It feels, you know, there's, there's a momentum building Everywhere we turn in the world, we're just seeing women's leadership emerging with these like amazing ideas. Uh, and I think Canada has a really deep competitive advantage around this because the world lives here uh, and we are in community together. So I'm deeply optimistic about where things are going. Uh, it's going to be bumpy through the COVID piece, but um, I think we really haven't even seen uh, the tip of the iceberg of the innovation that exists in our country. And when we get um, through some of these barriers, uh, we're going to see just uh, big shifts. Great to hear that optimism. That's fantastic. I think, you know, we probably have time for maybe one more question. What should we be asking business leaders to do um, in the private sector? What to those people who've already made it? Um, what can they be doing to really help our entrepreneurial community uh, and specifically those underrepresented groups that we've been talking about? Minister Ng, I'll turn it over to you. Be an ally. And uh, but what I mean by that is be an ally but uh, give of your experience and of your networks to others who would not have access to that. And that's what these ecosystems are about. That is why, you know, I, uh, you know, on behalf of the federal government have the trade toolbox. I mean, I make available um, Canada's Trade Commission who works in 160 offices, uh, you know, I make available Export Development Canada, Business Development Canada, Canadian Commercial Corporation. I mean, these are very important uh, institutions. And to me, they are allies of uh, the businesses, the small businesses, the uh, racialized businesses that, uh, that ever need us to do that work with them alongside. So my advice, be an ally especially uh, our terrific business leaders in the country. Um, if you want to see greater prosperity and job growth in this country, you have a role to play. And, uh, and let's use what you've got. And, uh, and if you're generous to give us of that, to give the people of Canada that, that would be hugely appreciated. Couldn't agree more. Peggy, your thoughts? What can business leaders be doing? Well, I think we need more role model. You know, we were uh, talking earlier about, uh, you know, having a, a feminist prime minister. I'd like to see a CEO of a large bank being uh, a feminist CEO. I'd like to see uh, the leader of a large telco being uh, a feminist CEO. So uh, very often we, we tend to think that it becomes the challenge of the people who are at the margin, like, like Vicky mentioned. And uh, it, it should be a challenge that is embraced by everyone regarding of their gender and uh, their color, their background. Uh, and um, I would really, really love to see people who are actually not uh, being impacted by this beer embracing the agenda. That's where we're going to have way more power um, because otherwise there is always this beer that uh, we are uh, trying to help ourselves. 
Uh, and I really, really want to have, uh, you know, a hundred percent of the population, not just the 10, 15 or 50 percent impacted there. So, um, again, I, I will echo what uh, Minister Ng said, you want to help with opening your network, giving advice and all of that. I think all of us already are doing that a lot, but you need everyone to do that again, not just not just the people impacted. Vicky, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go right at this here, which is like uh, interrogate your leadership. How are you part of upholding racist systems in this world? We got to go there. The self transformation is is absolutely a prerequisite for transforming systems. So if you're a leader who's surrounded by the same people you were po pre COVID, get out of your bubble, change what it looks like at the table, start having conversations that make you uncomfortable. Uh, we have to break down and decondition ourselves. You can't just do, you know, add women and stir, you know, create a black version of the existing models. The structures are the problem. So if you have exactly the same structure and you're not talking about how we literally, like what are the barriers deeply underneath this? It's a problem. And then the last thing I would say is empathy, empathy, empathy. Um, we are seeing inside people's lives, there's a lot more humanity being brought into the workforce, which I'm very excited about. We wouldn't have guessed that people could work at home or lots of people wouldn't have guessed that. And we're seeing that that's possible now. There's a sort of higher level of trust. Uh, and I think really um, doubling down on our empathy around how complex people's lives are and how business and the workforce really needs to change to, uh, to actually work better for humans. So those are a few of my thoughts. Thank you. I mean, you know, I do hope that one of the good things that comes out of COVID is hopefully, you know, the barriers around working from home and flexibility and, and, and really being, um, really thinking more about our employees and their families and, and what they're dealing with outside of work sticks with us. And, and hopefully we bring that post COVID into our work world so that it does fundamentally change things and, and the way we work. Um, Cause I think that certainly would, would help with some of the some of the issues that we're seeing today. Well, we've, we've come to the, the end of our time. I wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today, for giving us your perspectives, taking the time to talk to our audience. Uh, it's such an important issue. It's something that Canada is deeply committed to, making sure we are creating a diverse and inclusive society and certainly uh, economy. So thank you, Minister Ng. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Peggy, so much for joining us here today. Goodbye, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Jennifer. Thank you Bye. so much. Thanks, Jennifer, for this.